Good morning, Wednesday morning. And as we say in Scotland, it is an offy drich day the day. D R E I T C H. Drich. And um, as only a Scottish person would understand, on this drich morning, good morning, Cindy. As I was saying there, only a Scottish person will understand on this Dreek morning. The rain is like a mist and it's that rain that gets you awfully wet. Folk go, but all rain gets you wet. But the rain this morning is that sticky wet rain that just seems to soak you and it's fine mist. But there's a, there's a waterfall. It's a guy dreek day to day, so it is. It's dreek and stinky. Good morning. So, is your past dictating your present? I'm in go slow mode today. I feel like it's Friday. Um, yeah, so how did this little... How did this little uh, conversation come up? Good morning, Mr. Divine. I hope you're well. hope you're all well. Good morning. Oh, you're back at work today, Ange. Good luck with that. That'll be exciting for you. Back in amongst it. That's excellent. So. Is it what? Is it what in Heidegwai, Cindy? A wet, dreek morning. So, is your past dictating or dominating your present? And are triggers in your environment still taking you down a very isolated tunnel down the rabbit hole? Right, so how this morning came about was um, messaging back and forth yesterday with a Facebook buddy about post-traumatic stress disorder, right, PTSD. Now, I'm not going to go into talking about PTSD because it's super complicated and definitely deserves and honours more than what 20 minutes I've got this morning to talk about it. But post-traumatic stress disorder, um, again, you know, I like to debate semantics somewhat and I personally don't see it as a disorder. So a post-traumatic stress reorder I would probably say because what post-traumatic stress trauma does to the brain is reorders the brain um, and fundamentally at a very basic level the brain why have we got a brain the brain's set up in a way in order for us to survive but when the stress of an event or a trauma becomes inescapable where you are fight, flight or freeze, where you're in a constant state of hypervigilance, your reality then becomes a very daunting and very um, stressful, threatening place to be, right? So over a prolonged period of time, when we look at post-traumatic stress disorder, now I did work with, uh, I did work with a psychiatrist that's big into neurofeedback, uh, turned out he wasn't quite as um, quite the guy I thought he was, but he did tell me that he has discovered the signature for PTSD in the brain. So looking at it from a quantitative electrocenophonograph, he was able to say, and of course, the more I got to know him, the more his arrogance as he jumped up and down saying that he had discovered the star and that he shall be published. Um, actually made me lose some credibility in him, but... According to him, there is a signature for post-traumatic stress disorder in the brain. So when you're looking at the electrical imaging of the brain, there's actually a signature there for it. But what we do know happens when we have been in chronic stress or inescapable stress, that we're caught in the fight, flight or freeze network in the brain. Um, what happens is the amygdala in the brain, the amygdala, two almond-shaped little dudes that sort of sit sort of behind the eyes. If you stuck pins through the eyes or crochet needles through the eyes and through the ears, your amygdala sit where those, uh, where those 
where those needles would cross, right? So the amygdala, which is like your, I guess, parking warden that allows information into the brain, stuff like that, right? So the amygdala goes into hyper alert when we have been faced with conditions of stress, uh, un inescapable stress and fear responses. So the amygdala goes into hyper alert, right? And the prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain here, the logical, rational kind of thinking part of the brain, that goes into reduced activity, right? That starts to slow down. So this is your thinking brain. So in actual fact, if a stressful event occurred to you, so for an example, you are walking over a bridge where it's 15 degrees Celsius, right? It is 6.30 on an autumn evening. There is a man with a yellow hoodie coming towards you with a knife and steals your right? So look at the components that have made up that memory. So the components that have made up that memory is temperature, 15 degrees Celsius. Was it was it was it misty? Was it humid? Um, was it was it warm? Was it a warm breeze? Was it cool? You're on a bridge, right? Which has its own fear response as well, because the body doesn't like being off the ground. So that triggers a response naturally anyway, right? Then you've got yellow hoodie. You've got man. Oh yeah, let's add this in. Beard, right? Man, beard, knife. Uh, time of night, temperature, etc., etc., etc. Right. So that then becomes you go into a fear response, uh, becomes a stress reorder of the brain, and that trauma is now locked in the brain. And of course, because you felt paralysed, powerless, unable to act, froze, etc., 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 and on it goes, that is now logged in the memory banks of the brain as a dangerous situation. So anytime you come to a situation like that in your external reality, your narrative, the brain goes into survival mode. Now that could mean that you're walking on a bridge. That's going to trigger the response, right? You could be walking down a normal street and there's a man with a beard wearing a yellow hoodie, right? Even the temperature and the olfactory memories, if there was any sounds at the time, that are going on at a non-conscious level could then be triggering your traumatic experience, Right? So, how do we go beyond our past dictating and dominating our present and current reality? Now, as I've said, your amygdala goes into high alert. Your prefrontal cortex goes into slow mode, right? Now, I'm going to talk about something that I've kind of shied away from for three months, but... Um, if you, I am not suggesting this, but if you are interested in looking at uh, what is now almost six months or a year away from uh, FDA approval in the United States, which is, psych I'm going to say it really quickly, psychedelic psychotherapy, right? Now, the use of psychedelics within psychotherapy, um, what that does is that works on the default mode network in the brain, which is fundamentally your ego and how you put things into perspective. But what it also does is it decreases activity in the amygdala, increases activity in the prefrontal cortex and starts a communication between the amygdala and hippocampus. Hippocampus is where memories are formed and some of those memories may be uh, traumatic, toxic and indeed giving you the feel of inescapable stress and an inability to move beyond your current paradigm. Okay, so without using psychedelics, how can you manage your post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, a wise man once said to me many, many, many years ago, he said, Ross, you cannot heal the deepest fractures in your psyche. You cannot heal the deepest wounds in your mind. What you can do is become aware of them, and through awareness, the awareness will lead you... Uh, the, the awareness I think about this Lost the, you'll, never de you'll never heal the deepest fractures in your psyche all you can do is the awareness that will release you from the compulsion, the pathology or the addiction right, so bringing awareness to our behaviours 
but looking at it from a bystander's perspective or the perspective of the observer or being able to look at it objectively. I'm going to be really, really simplistic here. I mean, A, time is of the essence this morning. But when a traumatic event has occurred in our lives, it's occurred to us in that moment. We perceive it as inescapable. There's a stress response. There's a biochemical response to our body. Our body then doesn't want to relive that experience because our brain's set up for survival. So what we do is we start to avoid situation, people, places and things that make us feel as if we're stuck, for a better word. Right? Now, the only way that we can go beyond that is go beyond the mind that created it because you'll never solve a problem from the mind that created the problem in the first place. So what can you do today? One of the best things that you can do today in order to, because post-traumatic stress disorder has decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex. So how can we scientifically, right, with the tools that you have in your kitchen right now, increase activity in your prefrontal cortex? We increase activity in the prefrontal cortex through meditation, right? Now, the difficulty here is, is when we have post-traumatic stress disorder, or reorder as I like to call it, um, our mind is going at 100 miles an hour, right? 1,000 miles an hour. Our brain is in hyperspeed. We're hypervigilant, right? So in order to meditate, we've got to slow the mind down enough because the brain's, the brain's in warp drive because it's looking, it's trying to encode its environment in order to keep it safe. The paradox about that is the level of hypervigilance that we're in while we're scanning our environment in order to try and keep us safe is actually what's keeping us unsafe, right? Because fight, flight or freeze is only useful when we inject it in the moment of the threat, right? When we start to relive that, that then is the inescapable stress and makes our reality and our world very, very small, very, very frightening, can become obsessive, leads to anxiety, would almost make you become self-obsessed in a lot of ways, where you're thinking and ruminating, right? Now, if you're using the engine, the brain, in a hypervigilant kind of way, you're depleting lots of neurochemicals that you would normally have in balance if you were living in inverted commas a normal life. Now, meditation. Training your brain to quieten and as you're able to train the brain, you're able to come into the position of the observer. What I mean by that is we are in a movie. We are living with the inescapable stress. We're living with the trauma. We're living with the fear. We're living with the anxiety, right? It's happening as if it's going on in a movie. The goal and our objective is to get ourselves to a point where we're able to take ourselves out of the movie and sit in the audience and watch the film as if it's going on, but not happening to us, right? What that then allows us to do is go beyond the default network in the brain, which is the ego, if you like, right? And start to look at it from a more objective position. Sorry, lost signal there for a wee minute. Look at it from a more objective position, right? So how do you stop yourself going down the rabbit hole? Well, that's really, really difficult because the minute you start thinking in a certain way, you start getting a chemical component of it, right? You start to, you go down a, you go down a very, you, you, you enter into a four-speed autobahn highway of um, electrochemical compulsions that are set up in order to go along with the electrical thinking of your brain. So you see a guy, as I said earlier on, guy, knife, bridge, yellow hoodie, Right, the minute you see the yellow hoodie, you get gifted with a massive amount of chemicals. Now, if I put that to illicit drug use, if you put the if you put the twenty pound note to a line of cocaine and you start sniffing it, and you're even so far down it, and your brain's going, "What are you doing?" Right, you're committed. Within a few seconds, that drug's in your body. That's it. Right, it's too late at that point to not snort it. You can't rewind it. You've then got a chemical component going through your body that increases your heart rate, dilates your pupils, sweaty palms, etc, 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 right? So, what all we can do, if we're not using psychedelics, set and set in places, because um, that's way down the line in the UK, but as I said, it's about a year away, if that, it's about nine months away, following what MAPS are doing, that's M-A-P-S, 
you're interested in their studies and research that's been going on for over 30 years, they're a fantastic organisation of which I have been in touch with many times over the last few years, right? So, um, the more that we are able to increase the activity in the prefrontal cortex, when we start to see ourselves go, so if you watched a vlog that I did a little while ago, um, like what, what, what neurotransmitters uh, through me working with my own recovery, um, I found out what neurotransmitters that I was low in. I was low in GABA because one of my um, character defaults, if you like, was rumination, right? was just working myself up and ruminating and ruminating and almost obsessive compulsive thinking in a negative way around about people, places and things, right? Um, now, that would have been GABA that I would have been low in, right? So, if you have found yourself in a position through your stress reorder, reorder of the brain, now, post-traumatic stress disorder, again, people were asking, um, what is an effective therapy for it? Well, neurofeedback's a phenomenal therapy for it because what starts to happen is the electrical activity in the brain starts to formulate. Now, through talking therapy, talking therapy can be, I'll go back to the neurofeedback bit in a minute and jump about, but talking therapy where you actually relive the trauma can actually have more devastating effects than, um, than not doing it, to be fair, because, and also, it takes a very, very long time. Now, the debilitating effects of post-traumatic stress disorder are limiting your life, uh, causing you to be isolated, lonely, lost, depressed, etc. Which comes to me bringing into the fact that we have lost connection. We have become disconnected from ourselves and from our environment. And the way that we have done that is order to survive. The reason that we've disconnected from our environment is again another survival mechanism but in actual fact because we're social creatures the paradox again of that is that the only way that we can survive is through being connected you know you could get into a theological debate as well and going well where, where was the first time that i disconnected was it that i disconnected from source coming to this world and forgetting that i was part of spirit if you believe in that analogy could that be our first trauma could that be our first disconnection and how do we reconnect back to the mothership so, neurofeedback, uh, something that I've been involved in for the last 10 years. Um, I've not been doing a whole lot of it lately. Uh, I've kind of moved away from that. And that's very helpful because what neurofeedback does is neurofeedback is a way of retraining the electrical activity. Now, what I was saying, retraining. Now, using a feedback mechanism that retrains now, a lot of people are like big in these binary beats and all that kind of jazz and frequency of music. Now, they're all very well. They're all very good. Okay, they may give you a feeling. They're like drugs to me. Binary beats and all that kind of jazz, right? They're like drugs because they make you feel okay when you're using them. But when you're not, you don't feel any better. And the reason why that is, is because there's no retraining Right, it's just in this moment, right? It, there's no retraining of the brainwave activity in order to manage your brain and order this defragment the computer and start to work more effectively. What neurofeedback can do is break the electrical component, sorry, the chemical component to the electrical thought that in this case that we're talking about is trauma. So neurofeedback can be a very helpful thing to do. Now, if we start to slide down the rabbit hole, now one of the questions I would ask right, is, okay, you've went down the rabbit hole, right, and it's happened at light speed, right, it's happened super fast, we don't have any control over it, and heavens forbid, nobody would consciously want to feel those kind of feelings, but, think of this as an analogy, a child, right, a small child that's hospitalised for a long time, so we're looking at this psychoanalytically, psychotherapeutically we're, um, we're tracking a child's development, right? And a child goes into hospital when it's, um, when it's little. So when it's in hospital, mummy, daddy, aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters, cats, dogs, come in to visit the child in hospital. Now let's say that child 
experiences prolonged, long-term uh, care within a hospital environment, right? So then, that's not a normal situation. But every time that mummy and daddy comes to visit child, right? Every time that mummy and daddy comes to visit child, they bring balloons and they bring cake and they bring grapes and they bring things that mum and dad don't normally bring you if they come up to see you playing in your computer games right up the stairs every time mum and dad comes up they don't come up with balloons and everything like that so at an unconscious level the child then unconsciously gets a sense of where it's getting its needs met right um where it might be getting treated like a king so then the child becomes into adulthood and the child keeps creating phantom, if you like, the, the, the now child adult, adult child, then starts to create phantom experiences where it seems to be going to the doctors a lot and getting taken into hospital a lot because when it's in hospital, it's getting a lot of attention, right? So that's a quite well-known psychoanalytical analysis of looking back at what happened in your past that you're creating in your present in order to get a need met. Now, your post-traumatic stress is a horrible thing. It's a very debilitating thing. And um, I have experienced post-traumatic stress. So I am not making a mock of it at all, right? And even thinking back, but the toes never curled for me as I spoke about it there. Um, but, you know, um, one of the most horrific, one of them was a motorcycle accident, you know, and I was reliving that over and over and over again in my mind. And sometimes I'd just be sitting, I'd just be sitting around dinner table or something like that, right? And then I would I would experience it and I would do that. It was like a tick. I developed a tick. I thought we'd be like, you all right? You know, you all right? Hi, I am fine. I was actually, could have been just sitting doing nothing and reliving that. And then I would, I would other bits and bobs, right? Um, but I'm not going to bore you with that stuff. So when you are in that traumatic experience, it's very, very hard to get yourself back out of it. But one of the fastest ways through it is to start to do behaviours that allow... Because you're never going to take it away. What you are then and what you can then become able to do is watch it as an observer, free from the chemical component, or at least start to reduce the chemical component. Now, what I started talking to you about was me being low in GABA, right? So... Am I completely healed? No. Am I enlightened? No. Uh, do I have an awakened state of consciousness? No. But because I lived 24 hours a day, seven days a week for such a long time, so low in GABA, right, that I had high levels of anxiety and that I would ruminate and obsess about certain things, mainly negative. My nickname was Victor Meldrew, right? It was like a bloody moaning old man before my time, right? And that would have then made me appear quite self-obsessed, right? But the self-obsession was because of the mosquito bite that was actually anxiety, right? Which was coming from early childhood post-traumatic stress, right? So, now that I have been free of that for quite a while, right? That any time that I start to notice myself ruminating about an event that's happened and oh, I wish I'd said that, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd jumped up off the table and did a Hong Kong Fui move or whatever, I am very apt now at being able to see how that makes me feel. Now, I never knew that before because that was my constant state, that was my natural state of being. But now my natural state of being is much more, I like it, I'm in a good place right now, right? That's nice. So when I start to find myself going down that rabbit hole of obsession and starting to think, and catching myself doing it, I also am now able to see what that feels like in my body. And I go, tuh, 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 don't like that. Right? I don't like that feeling. So then I have to take responsibility for my mind. And I have to then up my game. I have to up my game. So rather than maybe walking this walk, eight miles, seven, eight miles in the morning, I need to start doing that twice a day. I have to make time for that. I also have to look at my diet. I have to look at things that's going to help and assist me to get myself... I was going to use the word strong, but strong's not right because post-traumatic stress, you're a lot stronger than you are when you're not got it because you're holding up the pillars, if you like, um, on your shoulders. So bringing awareness to where you're at, right? And starting to see yourself not as a failure. You're not doing anything wrong. And you've been in it for such a long time. Let's go back to the child that's in the hospital. 
that when you start to become connected, let me give you this example, right? Somebody that's been in a really toxic relationship for a long time, right? Um, whatever that might be. Now, that could be a toxic relationship with a partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, right? It could even be a job, right? It could be anything. That's became your new normal, if you like, right? That's became your new normal. So then, all you've ever known is a boss that shouts at you or a girlfriend that, that, that belittles you at every turn in social circles and settings and all the rest of it. Um, or a boyfriend that's angry and hostile and tries to control the environment through using size and weight or whatever, right? Then, generally speaking, as I've said about the hospital thing, the majority of people that are in abusive relationships, be that male or female, or even having a boss or a bad job or things like that, somewhere in their childhood, they've experienced inescapable stress, right? And then they start to replicate that in their current reality. Now, when you take that person out of that environment, which they've been used to for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you put them in a relationship with a kind and loving female partner who loves you and accepts you, who runs you a bath, who actually is just with you because they want to be with you and have fun with you, right? That feels unusual, right? Now, negative, you've got abusive. Obviously, nobody wants that at a conscious level. And then you've got kind, happy and accepting. Now, for somebody that's been in that stressful position, that toxic relationship for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, right, or whatever, when you put them in a kind, warm relationship, that feels unusual and uncomfortable, right? So by the default network... What we do is we go back to a situation that's familiar, even if it is toxic, right? Even if it is difficult, because the one that we've got where there's love and compassion and care and kindness, right? In the onset of that, we don't have any control. Whereas in a kind of perverted kind of way, when we're in a very limited, destructive and toxic environment, at least we know that. So we can start to predict that sort of behavior, which gives us a sense of control. Now, remember, the brain doesn't know the difference between a positive and negative experience, right? As long as the brain's getting attention or fed or met. So back to me jumping about a wee bit. I told you this was complicated. I'm going to hang up soon because I need to start running. Um, so if you've got post-traumatic stress disorder or an inescapable stress and, you know, for a few days things have been going quite good, then you realise, oh my goodness, things have been going quite good. Then you start to judge and doubt and question and think, oh no, when's that dark dog going to come back? When's that horrific experience going to come back? So when's the carpet going to be pulled from underneath my feet? When's the rug going to be taken from beneath me? So then what you start to do, rather than waiting for it to happen in the external environment, you take yourself down that road. You take yourself down that passageway, right? And what that allows you to do is sit in a dark room, quiet and isolated, away from your family, friends and loved ones. And it means that you don't give it means that you get to disconnect. And in a sort of roundabout way, we can become selfish in our own isolation, right? But we've got a really good excuse for it. We've got a really good excuse for it because this happened to me when I was a child, right? Now, probably the wrong choice of words, excuse, a reason, right? I've got a reason for this. I can get to be like this because this happened to me when I was a child, right? Now, if you've been telling that story or you've now became identified with that narrative, right? And you've been telling that story for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, right? Um, I totally get how debilitating, right? And how toxic that is to live in that place in your mind. And personally speaking, the only way that I can see through that is through allowing yourself to be freed from the two-dimensional constructs of your default mode network, that's D-M-N, network in your brain, right, where you can defragment the ego, which, yes, is trying to keep you safe, but has now got you prisoner, right, and unfortunately, the fastest route and most effective, far more effective than cetraline, um, because all these things are just treating the symptoms, not the cause. Good morning, sir. How are you? You well? Good, yes, yes. Super. Um, yes, would be looking at what's yet not legal in the United Kingdom. So, is the past dominating, dictating and owning you in the present? Has this made sense? I hope. And uh, have a great Wednesday. Wishing you all the very best. Stay safe.